church, how we doing? Feeling good? Ready to worship? Let's stand together.
King of heaven, here be magnified.
Father, we thank you that your promises never fail, that your thoughts and your plans for us are good. Thank you that you said that in Jeremiah 29, 11, that th these are the thoughts that I think toward you. I think good thoughts towards you, not evil thoughts. I give you, my plans towards you are, are good to give you a future and a hope. I thank you that that's your declaration over your people, that you have good thoughts and good plans for us. And I thank you that your goodness is not just a, a mood that you get into when you have good days and fall out of on your, on when, when you have a hard day or something like that. Your goodness is not an attitude that you get into. Your goodness is a part of your nature. You are good and you never change. And therefore, when we trust in your goodness, when we believe in your goodness, when we lean into the fact that you are good and believe it, we, we can have stability in the midst of unstable times in the midst of difficult situations and circumstances in our lives. Your goodness gives us stability. It gives us that hope and that good future, that good expectation of your goodness to come in the future. We thank you for your goodness, Father. And Father, we pray for this morning that you'd bless the message, that you'd bless Pastor Rick as he delivers your word to us, that you would give us a heart to receive all that you have for us today, that you would give us that hope that makes us buoyant in the midst of troubling times. We love you, we praise you, we thank you, and everybody said, amen. Let's clap for the Lord this morning. Awesome, excellent. Well, you can have a seat. I wanna welcome you to the Rock Church this morning. We are so glad that you're here. For those of you in the sanctuary, in the auditorium, and online, we just wanna greet you and say we are so glad to be back together again. One quick announcement before we go into our video announcements is, is just a reminder to keep your masks on for the duration of our service. We really wanna honor our county and, and also to be able to keep meeting as a church ongoing into the future and not get shut down again um, because of a lack of safety protocol. So if you could do us that favor and keep your masks on the duration of the service, even during worship, I know it's difficult, but that'll help us to continue to meet on into the future to come. Well, we got a great message from Pastor Rick coming up, but before we go into that, let's check out these video announcements. Thanks for joining us this morning. We wanted to take a few moments to share some ways for you to stay connected to God through our events here at The Rock Church. This year's summer camp called Camp Us is from July 30th through August 1st and will be held right here at The Rock. We will worship each night with our Rock worship team and hear powerful messages from our youth and children's pastors. The early bird price ends this Tuesday, so be sure to visit our website to sign up today. Due to the recent uptick in COVID-19 cases, we have made the very difficult decision to cancel our Wednesday night services for the month of July. We want to provide the healthiest and safest environment for everyone who attends our church. We believe this is the best solution for us and our community at this time. The Rock will still be having services on Sundays, so be sure to visit our website, Facebook page, and YouTube page. Our plans are to keep everyone informed once we believe it is safe for us to worship together again on Wednesday nights. Save the date. Our men's retreat is scheduled for Friday, September 11th through Sunday, September 13th. Our women's retreat will be from Friday, October 9th through Sunday, October 11th. Stay tuned as we'll have more information soon about these upcoming retreats. Our next discipleship class, Level 1, begins August 15th. This class will be online. Sign-ups are now open and go quickly, so register today. We have several ways you can give. Either visit our website or text GIVE to 925-350-4832. If you are looking to receive updates via text message, text ROCK GUEST to 33222 and we'll send you more information on how to get connected. Stay updated by following us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for all of our services and events. 
If you have questions or want to find out more, visit our website at therockca.com. Finally, we invite you all to stand up and greet one another. However, make sure not to high five or hug during this time. Good morning, everybody. Now, <clears throat> here's the deal. People online are watching all over the world right now. We got, hold on. We got people here in, in, in the United States, and we've got people in the auditorium. They're relying on you to listen good and amen well. They're, they're listening. So you, this, yeah, yeah. So it's not a time to be quiet and polite, okay? This is a time to go, yeah. I mean, you, don't be weird. Don't be weird. Like, don't say weird stuff like, yeah, donuts. Don't say stuff like that. If you have your Bible, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. And we're in a series called Jesus, Our Everything. And today we're talking about Jesus, our mighty God. And uh, I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to get into this. Father, thank you for the word. Lord, thank you that your word is truth, and it doesn't change. And I pray that as we get into just talking about you being the mighty God, Jesus, that our faith would grow today, that our idea about you, Lord, where we see you wrong, that we would see you clearly for who you really are. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Last week, we talked about Wonderful Counselor, that part of that scripture that he's a supernatural counselor. How many of you know we need a good counselor right now? There's a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. There's all kinds of opinions and ideas. We need someone that can give us great counsel, and that's who he is. He is the wonderful counselor. So this week we're going to talk about mighty God. I want to read to you seven verses out of Isaiah. And this little chunk of verse we just read is inside that. Isaiah 9, verse 1. I'm going to read to you all seven verses because this is powerful. And then I'm going to show you how Jesus fulfilled this. So this is long before Jesus was born. This was prophesied about him. Isaiah 9 verse 1. Nevertheless, there will be no no more gloom for those who were in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the Gentiles by the way of the sea along the Jordan. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. And those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation, increased their joy. They rejoice before you. As people rejoice at the harvest, as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered uh, the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, every warrior's boot used in battle, and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning will be fuel for the fire, for unto us a, uh, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness. For that, from that time on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish it. This is a prophetic prophecy about Jesus and what he would do when he came to earth. And how many of you know we need heaven? What we're looking for, what everyone's crying out for, I'm going to say some crazy stuff, but it's, it's biblical. What people are crying out for is they're crying out for heaven. The protesters are crying out for heaven. They don't know it, though. They just want justice. They want peace. They want, they want equality. They, how many of those are good things? But the government cannot give you those things. Only Jesus can bring those things. I want to show you just real quick, according to verse 7, four truths about Jesus' government, his rule and reign, and his kingdom when he comes, because it's right there in verse 7. Number one, his government is ever-increasing. How many know the gospel is spreading all over the world? You can't stop it. A pandemic can't stop it. The Chinese government that says you can't worship Jesus here and there is no God is the, is the largest church in the world is the Chinese church. It's the underground church. You can't stop the gospel. 
He's ever increasing. He's ever winning people into his kingdom. He's ever reaching out. His government continues to expand. Number two, his government is peaceable. And it's true. When I let Jesus be more Lord of my life and I let him rule, how much more peace I get? Some of you are like, well, you know, I, I, I'm not sure. Maybe just you don't walk with God very much. You're a believer, but you don't pray as much as you should, or you don't spend time with him. You're not in the word. You're not yielding to his lordship, and you still have stuff going on in your life. You're like, man, I just can't figure this out. It's because you're not letting Jesus, the Prince of Peace, rule in your heart and rule in your mind and rule in your decisions. And so you got a little bit of Jesus on Sunday. You come say hi, but then the rest of the week, you're doing what you want. And I'm here to tell you, the more I surrender, the more peace I have in my soul. The more peace I have in my life, the more that I trust him. Amen? Amen. Verse three, or uh, number three, his government is righteous. I mean, it's good to have somebody in charge that is a righteous person. Go through history and look at leaders of governments that were not good people and they murdered their people and they destroyed their, their nations because they didn't rule in righteousness. Jesus will come and rule in righteousness. Administered, watch this, he will administer with prudence and equity and justice and judgment. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he's the, he's the great judge. The Bible says he's the righteous judge. When this is all over and life is done and we're all standing before the Lord, somehow the righteous judge is going to make everything work. No one's getting away with anything. I say it all the time. The, the sex traffickers that we go, why would the Lord allow this? Well, they have free will and they're doing what they want. But there will come a day, hopefully they get saved before that day and they meet Jesus. But if they don't, they'll stand before him and they'll give an account for everything. He's the righteous judge. The world's crying out for heaven. The world's crying out for the kingdom to reign. They just don't know it. They want justice. They want, they want righteousness. They want the rule, but they don't. Well, some of them don't want righteousness. They just want their way. But Jesus wants to come, and when he comes into an environment, he sets up his lordship. Watch this. Everything changes. There's peace. There's righteousness. And when people say, well, I'm a believer. I know Jesus, but they're not living it. I go, maybe Maybe you said the prayer at church, but maybe he's not your Lord. Maybe you just shook hands with him as Savior, but you didn't say, Jesus, come and be the Lord of my life. Because there is something great that, now I'm not going to tell you that when you get saved, everything's perfect. How many of you know when you get saved, you're going to get persecuted? How many of you know once you get saved, there's a battle? But I'm talking about his kingdom ruling in your heart. So Isaiah 9 is really a prophecy about Jesus the Messiah. I think it's cool that God sent his son into the world they were waiting for their Messiah, and a lot of them missed him because he didn't come the way that they think he should come. He came as a baby. I mean, God snuck on right past him. Like, the enemy didn't know what was going on. He just he snuck on right past him, and then God in his wisdom, his son was crucified for the sins of the world. His son was given so that he could bring life to the world. I want to show you how Jesus fulfilled Isaiah. Matthew chapter 4, verse 12. This is powerful. This is literally, if you take Isaiah 9 that I just read and read this, you're like, wow, this, Jesus fulfilled this. Matthew 4, verse 12, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. Those are the two places we just read about. To fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah, the land of Zebulun, the land of Natali, the way to the sea along the Jordan of Galilee of the Gentiles, the people living in darkness have seen a great light, and those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is amazing. They reject the Lord in Isaiah. They reject the Lord's rulership and leadership in their life. And they get plunged into darkness. How many of you know that when, when, when generation after generation lives ungodly, that's, that without the Lord's intervention, it just gets darker and darker and darker. And alcoholism and drug addiction and divorce and bondage just gets passed down. And that's what happened. So for years, there was great darkness. And then Jesus is born and he comes on the scene. The mighty God, look right here. He's called Mighty God, not Junior God, not Mini God. He's called the Mighty God. He is the Mighty One of Heaven who has come down. And they, these people were plunged into darkness, and God in His goodness did not leave them in that darkness. The Bible said a light dawned. Watch this, light. 
came into their darkness. God wasn't saying, produce your own light. Get out of your own bondage. He didn't say, that's what man-made religion does. Produce your own stuff. Figure it out. Here comes the Lord coming through darkness, the light. Imagine you're lost in the woods. Ever been in the woods and it's real dark? Anybody? Just me? Okay, you guys need to get out more. You're, you're in darkness. I've been there and it's super dark and all of a sudden it's so refreshing to see a light coming. A little light and you're like, oh, what is that? And you start going, that's what Jesus did. Watch, the mighty God came into darkness that had ruled and reigned in people's lives for generation upon generation. And the Bible says this, that Jesus came and this is what he preached. This is so cool. Repent. It wasn't repent. That's how we, we think Jesus was. We think he was the angry preacher. Repent! I think when Jesus came to them and said repent, he had a smile on his face. He was like, hey guys, check it out. Repent, which simply means to turn away from your sin. It's, it just simply means to forsake your sin. That's what repentance is. Repentance is different than forgiveness. Forgiveness God gives us, but we have to repent and we have to turn away. And listen to what he said. He goes, when you repent... And you follow me, the kingdom is near. When you repent and come after me, the kingdom of God is near. How many want the kingdom in your life, near your life? John was in prison. He's in prison and he, 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 he's bummed out, man. He's been serving the Lord, doing good, and he's in prison. And what happens? They're going to behead him. And this is what he asks his disciples. Go and ask Jesus if he's the promised one or should we wait for another and what did Jesus say to John? He didn't say, yep. He said, go tell John that the gospel is being preached to the poor, that the captives are being set free, that people that have been in darkness are now free. He said, how do you know the kingdom's near when righteousness rules and miracles happen and the presence of the Lord is there and there's power to heal? And we've changed it now. We, we think the kingdom of God is when church is nice and safe. No, it's when the Lord comes and invades, when heaven touches earth, miracles start breaking out in power. And I'm going to talk about it in just a sec, and I'm probably going to get on a soapbox, and you're just going to have to deal with it. He's mighty. Think about it. The mighty God created everything. In, in, in Genesis 1, Jesus was there creating everything. He, he spoke, and the Red Sea opened up. I mean, think, think about it. You're, just be Moses for a minute. And you're, you're standing there, and you need to get to the other side. Listen, if I was at the lake, and I was like, Lord, I'd love to go to the other side of that lake. It's a big lake. I can't, it's going to be a long walk. And all of a sudden, music oh, started in the atmosphere. And all of a sudden, the lake opened up, and, and, and I walked through. How many of you know I would get to the other side and go, Lord, I'll never doubt you again? But it's funny about humans is that God shows himself mighty to us often, and as soon as we get into a problem, we wonder how mighty he still is. Right? He's the great I am. He's, and we, we think he's the great I was. He's the great I, he's still, look right here, he's still the great I am. When you read this, this isn't a storybook. This isn't like, oh, neat. Ooh, look what they did. Ooh, look at this miracle. Look at this power. Look at God inter, intervening in people's lives. I, I, want you to, I want you to see this. This is a story of the redemption of God and who he is. And some people preach him small. They preach against his nature. Oh, he doesn't do that anymore. Oh, he doesn't speak to people. Oh, he doesn't do miracles anymore. Oh, don't, don't go off on that tangent. Oh, don't get... He, there's no tongues anymore. There's no gifts of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't do that anymore. And I go, wow, you're preaching against... You know you're preaching against the very nature of God. You're saying that the God Almighty, Jesus, the mighty God who came and delivered and set people free, what you're saying is, is that he is small now and uninvolved. And I'll get into a little more of this theology in just a minute. How many just know I want to serve a mighty God? I don't want to serve a weak God. I don't want to serve small God. He's not small. I'm going to read you something out of uh, Numbers 11, and, and, and it's funny, I was reading this, and if you, I want you to read the whole chapter, because I find it humorous. Moses is tired of these people that he's led, and it's only been a short time at this point. 
He's bringing the children of Israel into the promised land. They're, mom, they're just worst church ever. Like that, he, he, he deserves the pastor of the year award for sure. They're just mumbling and complaining and just fighting with each other and just. It's like being in a car with four four year olds the whole way bickering and arguing. That's what it was like for him. And so they're in, in, in this story. Think about it the Red Sea opened up and drowned their enemies. The power of God. They saw it with their own eyes, and now they're like, listen what they complained about. We want meat. Meat. I want meat too. How many of you like meat? Okay, don't be offended if you're a vegan. Please don't be offended at this. I've been to people's houses, and they feed me, and we eat the green stuff, and then they come out with this thing, and I go, what's that? And they go, is that, is that meat? Right? That's how I feel. Well, it's meat, it's meat like. <laughs> what's meat like? Well, it's, and you, you cut into it, and you look at it, and you go, is that mud and sawdust? What is in there? And, and they go, oh, it's, it's bacon. Oh, don't blaspheme bacon like that. That is not, that is not bacon. That is, that is not good. And so I get the complaint about meat. But they're saying, where is your provision? And Moses, in, in, in Numbers 11, is like, I am done, Lord. Kill me, is what he literally says. Kill me now. These people are driving me up the wall. And watch what he says to the Lord, and then watch how the Lord responds to him. This is amazing. Numbers eleven twenty one. But Moses said, so he's talking to God, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. So this is including women and children. So I mean, it's a lot of people. And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if the flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them? So what is he doing? We have a massive problem, God. There's a million something people here, and we don't have enough. Look, they just went through the Red Sea. They just, God literally went, do you think he did that so he could kill them? Well, he ends up killing them because they won't obey. But anyways, that's a whole other story. And listen what the Lord asks him. I love when God asks questions. How many of you know he's not digging for information when he asks a question? He says, and the Lord answered Moses, is the Lord's arm too short? Wow. He goes, uh, you will now see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Here's the question. Is God's arm too short? What a great question. Do you know what God was doing with Moses? He was reminding Moses who he served. Because Moses was getting caught up into the pandemic. Oh, I might lose my job. How many know that's concerning stuff? God's not in heaven going, well, you know, I don't know why you're concerned about it. He knows we're concerned about it. But then we treat him as if his arm... I'm God Almighty. I hold the universe in the span of my hand. I knocked down the walls of Jericho. I gave you my son Jesus. Listen, miraculously rose him from the dead. But I don't know how I'm quite going to deal with your issue. Oh, you ever see little T-Rex? You know, you seen those T-Rexes? One of my favorite little memes is a T-Rex trying to play the drums. It just can't quite get there. God ain't no T-Rex, guys. He's not in heaven going, man, wish I could help. Wish I could figure this out. That's all the gods of men can do is stand around and go, "Mm." just keep groveling. Yeah, I don't know what to do. And the Lord's in heaven going, you guys, the nation's problems are as a drop in a bucket to me. Do you not remember, Moses, that I took you through the Red Sea? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. Quit freaking out. I'm the great I am. I'm the great almighty God. Jesus, the mighty God in, in Genesis 1, creating all things, speaking things. I got you. And then we're, in, we're just freaked out. How many, wouldn't it be terrible if you were pr- in prayer 
And you said to the Lord, Lord, I'm concerned and I'm a little anxious. And you heard back, me too. <laughs> How many know that'd be trouble? If you heard the Lord say, yeah, I'm kind of anxious too. I don't know what I'm going to do with all this stuff that's going on in the world. I don't know how I'm going to bring justice. I don't know how I'm going to bring peace. I don't know how I'm going to help you with your job. I don't know what I'm going to do about your marriage. I just, I, little T-Rex up in heaven wringing his hands because he doesn't know what to do. How many of the Lord's not in heaven going, man, I wish I was as powerful as I was in the Old Testament? Amen? Amen. Thanks. Isaiah 591 says this, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins uh, have hidden his face from you. So he will not hear you, for your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. Here's the cool thing. Sin is a block. Please hear what Jesus said. Repent, for the kingdom is where? Near. So how do, we, how do we cause the kingdom to be far from us? We live in sin and don't care and don't pursue and just let sin just, eh, whatever, sin's whatever. It's the world we live in. It's just the day that we live in. No, it's people who are after God. And when God reveals something that's not right in your, your soul, here's what's cool is you have the great ability to joyfully repent and see the kingdom come near and change things in you. The problem is we don't repent. And God wants to pour out. Did you know, I, I love Psalms 91. Everyone loves Psalms 91, right? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty God. And I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge. No evil shall befall you. No, nothing comes near your dwelling. And we're like, no plague. Yes, yes, yes. There, it's conditional. He who dwells in the secret place with the Most High God. He who, watch, follows. Not he who comes to church every now and again. Once every three months, I'll show up at church and do my thing. Hey, Lord, I'm here. Good. You know, that's a man-made God. That's a little T-Rex God. Hey, yeah, good to see you. God wants to come into your life. Jesus wants to be the Lord. He has so much more for us. His arm is not short, but we keep him out with our small thinking and even our sins that we need to repent from. And the Lord wants to come. He wants to come every single day into your life and do something powerful. His arm is not short. Amen? So repent. I love repent. I love the word repent. Because people preach it like, rah, 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 rah. I think it's joyful. Hey, Rick, you know, you're, you, ever, you ever read the Bible and he tags you? Something, something comes up and you go, oh. And then most of us run away. Oh, well, God must be mad at me. He revealed it. You know, he knew it was there beforehand. You're surprised. He's not. You're the one that just is getting news for the breaking news. You have a problem with greed. Oh, no, no, I don't. Really? Give some stuff away. Oh, no, no, no. I'm collecting all my stuff. I'm building barns for more stuff. And the Lord's like, give it away. And you're like, no, no, no. And then you're surprised by, you ever do that? You're surprised by your own grossness. You ever have a thought that you go, I am a disgusting human being? Anybody ever had that? Please don't look at me with your doctor masks on and, and just trying to, because you're making me feel weird. That's good. Repent right there in the moment. The Lord's not showing it to you to condemn you. He's showing it to you to heal you. He loves you. He's for you. Amen? Here's the problem today in our society. I have two more verses I'm going to share with you. The problem today is we have, and it's always been, the Pharisees were amazing at it, we have man-made theology. We make, men, we make God in our own image in our minds. Well, God would never do that, and God isn't like that, and God doesn't do that. And I was in a discussion with someone not too long ago about, because I get kind of radical, and I believe, I, I, I know it's audacious of me, but I still believe that he heals people. I know it's super crazy. It's super crazy. I still believe he heals. I still believe he gives words of knowledge. I still believe that we can pray in tongues. Yeah, it didn't stop. It's not ceased. Yeah, but they, were, they gave me this verse. Well, you know what the Bible says? I love it when they talk. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says when that which becomes perfect has come, the tongues will cease and knowledge will cease and these things will cease. And I'm, uh-huh. You know, it's talking about heaven, right? 
And they think, and they say, no, it's, this is the perfect, that we have the Bible, and so the Bible's been written, so therefore, we don't need those things anymore because we have Scripture. And this is what I said to them. So what you're telling me is that there's no more sick people in the world. There's no more broken people in the world. There's no more people that have demonic bondage. There's no more people that need liberty because we, we have the Bible now. So, I mean, sorry, dude, about your sickness. You're telling me that the great I am... Jesus, the mighty God, is no longer Jesus the same yesterday, today, and forever, the book of Hebrews says. You're telling me, watch, you're preaching his nature low. You're preaching his nature, who God is, who he always was in the Old Testament, who he showed up on the scene to show the Pharisees what God is really like because they just thought he was a bunch of rules and a bunch of Bible study. And he shows up on the scene and he starts healing people and setting people free. And they're freaking out going, well, who is this guy? Because he came to show them who the mighty father is that steps into our darkness, that comes into our world and changes people, that does miracles. And people go, well, you know, we, we shouldn't focus on miracles. We shouldn't see them. <laughs> and I'm like, are you telling me that the guy that has sickness, the guy who's in bondage, doesn't need us, and people say, well, you know, we don't heal anybody. And I go, it's true. I don't have any healing power. I just want you to know right now. Rick Fry is not, a, I, don't, I don't have any healing power. Remember when Peter healed the guy at the gate, beautiful? Remember? The, and everyone was like, you're, wow, you're amazing. And what they say, why are you looking at us like we're so awesome? This was a miracle that Jesus did. But it took faith. God used the man who was walking around, going to the mall, and seen a, saw a sick dude and was like, uh, Hey, get up. And he got up. The same God who did that still lives today. He's still mighty. He still wants to do miracles. Watch this. 2 Chronicles 16, 9. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth. What kind of earth? All of it. To show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. In this you have done foolishly. Therefore, from now on you shall have wars. In other words, they disobeyed. Watch what it says. God's eyes run to and fro across the earth through Danville, through San Ramon, looking for people whose hearts are loyal to him because through them he's going to show himself what? Strong. The problem is, how many of you just ever been caught doing something bad? I mean cold caught. I don't mean three weeks later. I mean in the moment. I've told you this story, but it's the only story I have because I only lived one life. But my, 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 uh, my mom and dad, for a little season, managed apartment complexes. There was a door here, and there was a door to these guys that lived next door who were friends of my brothers. They were all in high school. I was in junior high, and I would go hang out with them, and they would all sit in the living room, and they'd smoke weed. And I, I, would just, I was eighth grader, seventh grader. I don't remember what it was, and I would just sit and talk with them. You know that after, after you hang out with people long enough that are doing bad things pretty soon, you're going to start doing bad things? That's what the Bible says. Bad company corrupts good character is what this proverb says. They're smoking weed. And night after night after night, the bong would come past me. If you don't know what a bong is, ask your mom and dad later. It comes through, and I would just hand it off. I wouldn't, you know, I don't, I don't do that. And here it comes one night after a summer of sitting in their house. It comes up to me. And I'm like, eh, why not? Right? So I went after it. Just at the moment that I was breathing it in, the door to my friend's house opened, the door to my mom and dad's house opened, and my dad is standing in the doorway from me to the front row. And this is what he, this is what he did. Now, my dad was a pistol. He was a feisty dude. And he just looks at me and goes, he points at me, and I'm... <laughs> I look up and see him, and how, what do I do? I have to breathe. Smoke's billowing out of my mouth. <sighs> I hand it to my friend, and my dad just goes like this. He points at me and goes, I got up off the bean bag, <laughs> went through the beads. <laughs> For those of you that were alive in the 70s know what I'm talking about. I go through the beads. My dad says, Nothing. He says, Have a seat. We're watching the Twilight Zone together. Not a good combo cup right there. <laughs> watching, 
And he just, we watch it for 15, 20 minutes. He goes up, gets in the kitchen, says, hey, you want a Snickers bar? I'm like, yeah, I kind of do, actually. <laughs> and I said, no, no, no. And he goes, that doesn't go too good with weed, does it? And pot and beer. And I go, no, he went to bed. Left me sitting there watching the Twilight Zone. <laughs> Longing for a Snickers bar. I went to bed, got up the next morning, went to school, came home, thought, this is the day I die. Second day, this is the day I die. A month goes by. He has said nothing. Six months go by, nothing. I start serving Jesus. I'm like, Dad, what was up with that? He goes, I knew. I knew that you felt terrible. I knew that you, you yeah, my dad, whom I love and respect, just caught me in the moment. I want God the Father to catch me being faithful. I want him to catch me, zip, 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 zip across the earth. Hey, who's that guy? He knows me. Boom. He's going to find me being loyal. He's going to find me resisting sin, not going, eh, whatever, grace, man. He's going to find me going, no, I, I, I'm not going to live my life like that. I'm going to serve Jesus. I don't care what the world says and what the world does. I'm going to be faithful. And watch this. Something happens when we're faithful. God's power shows up. He wants to show himself strong. I want to show you this verse and close with this, Daniel eleven thirty two. 32. Those who do wig- wickedly against the covenant shall corrupt with flattery. But the people who know their God shall be strong and carry out great exploits. If your Christianity is boring, something's wrong. If your walk with God is boring and eh, whatever, eh, I go to church, I'm just going to go to church and I'm going to punch the card. Wifey's dragging me to church today. Something's broke. Because I wake up every day going, Lord, what are we doing? What do you want to do today? It's a great story. Our um, guy who basically runs our whole facility, his name is Ben Shrewsbury, young guy, great guy. He was taking a shower several weeks ago. And when he was in the shower, the Lord speaks to him. Now, I know he doesn't do that anymore. (laughs) But the Lord speaks to him and says, I want you to get dressed. It's nighttime. It's dark. I want you to go down to this parking lot. I don't remember what the school was. It was some school parking lot. And he says, there's going to be a white Jeep or a gray Jeep. I don't remember the color. And he says, there's going to be some teenagers in it. I want you to go tell them about me. He's like, no, this is weird. I'm tired. I have a headache. This is literally what he said. I don't want to go. And the Lord said to him, hurry up. Hurry up. So he's walking, and the Lord says, hurry up. And he starts going a little faster. (laughs) And he gets there, and the gray Jeep is pulling out of the parking lot just as he gets there. And he gets there and goes, hey, guys. I mean, how weird is this, right? Like, what do you say? Like, hey. <laughs> he goes, come here. And they go, what's up? And he goes, man, I just wanted to tell you guys about Jesus. God told me to come here and tell you about his love. They listened. I think it was yesterday or one day this week that he's friends with uh, some of the other guys on the team. This kid in the... Car shows up and he's like, hey, dude, I know you. Ben was in the foyer. This kid's coming to see somebody on our staff that he knows. And he's, their minds are blown away. And I, so I'm standing there in the foyer with him. And I say to the young guy, can I ask you a question? Why do you think, the, why, why do you think that happened? Why, why do you think God got a dude out of the shower who didn't want to come, told him to hurry up? And, and come and, and tell you about the love of God, to tell you about the love of Jesus. Why do you think God did that? It wasn't just so you could go, wow, man. It was because he loves you. And light came into the darkness in the form of a dude named Ben Shrewsbury. See, it's so, it's so demeaning to the Lord that we preach him small. It's so demeaning to the Lord to say, you don't do this anymore, you don't do that anymore, you don't do this anymore. You know what that is, guys? That's a man theology that makes God controllable. You control him now. You don't have to have faith. You don't got to seek God. You don't got to be faithful. You don't have to listen. Why? Because he doesn't do that anymore. You just blow it off. Instead of saying, Lord, today I'm going to go out and just do business as usual. If there's anybody that you want me to talk to, just let me know. That takes faith to go, I'm going to listen, and I'm going to get out of the shower, and I'm going to go obey. You see, man theology says, well, why bother? He doesn't do that anymore. And I say, he is still mighty in all his ways. Amen. (laughs) 
I'm going to have the worship team go ahead and make their way out. And we're going we're gonna to sing this last song and we're going to pray together as a church. And to those in the auditorium and to those online, I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to hear the Lord ask you a question. Is my arm too short that I can't provide for you? Heal, change, deliver, help you. Use your life to bring deliverance to somebody else. Do you make him small? Do you make him way off? T-Rex God doing nothing. He's mighty and he's alive today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the word of God. Thank you that you are mighty, Jesus. Your word declares that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, you loved people in the Old Testament. You, you met them. You healed them. You changed lives. Then you sent your son, Jesus, which was the greatest gift of all. And Jesus, you came healing and changing and bringing life. And I just declare today that you are the mighty God who still changes lives. You still care about sick people. You still have compassion and mercy on other people. With all eyes closed and even over in the auditorium and even in your house by yourself or wherever you are, I want you to sit for a moment and ask yourself this question. Am I saved? Ask yourself that question. Do I know Jesus Christ as my Savior and my Lord? He loves you. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to forgive your sins. But we have to come and repent. We have to come and say, Lord, I'm a sinner. And thank you that I have the privilege to repent because you want to bring your kingdom into my life and you want to change me. So even over in the, in the auditorium and here and online, if that's you and you would say, I need Jesus, I want you to do this before the Lord. This doesn't save you, by the way. Raising your hand doesn't save you. Believing in Jesus saves you. If that's you, though, and you want to acknowledge, man, I need Jesus, would you just raise your hand, even even in your house, even in this room, even in the auditorium, say, me, Lord, save me. Good, yes, awesome. Yes, good, yes, yes, good. Just, Father, just say this to him. Say, Father in heaven, I confess to you that I've sinned against you. I repent of my sins. I ask for your forgiveness. Jesus, wash me in your blood. Cleanse me from sin. Fill me with your spirit. Be the Lord and the Savior of my life. Let your kingdom fill my heart and fill my life today. In Jesus' name. Father, thank you today for how good you are. We're going to sing this song, and I, 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 we sang this song already in the first uh, part of our worship today, and it's funny because Will and Molly, Will, they're not married by the way, in case, in case you're wondering, Will is married to our children's pastor, this one is married to the guitar player in the back, so if you're a guy out there and you're thinking, wow, no, okay, no, so they've been here since they were in high school, they've been here a long time, they when I first got here, they were like in high school. Molly was like three feet tall. Will was a little taller. And they start, we started praying together and worshiping the Lord together in the prayer room. And God put a call on their lives, and it's powerful. And I've been bothering them. Guys, start writing worship songs. Because there's something powerful about when a church sings songs from its own tribe, from its own place. And so years went by, and I kept bothering Will kept bothering them. We kept praying and praying and praying. And there's a song they're going to share in three weeks that is unreal. And I told them, wait, copyright it, because somebody will steal that from you. This is a great song, and we sang it in the first service. And it's about being awakened to the Lord. And Molly and Will um, wrote this song uh, several weeks ago. And it's about being awakened to the Lord and having revival start in you. How many know it's easy to pray for revival, but don't affect me, Lord? easier to pray, will God touch them? How about Lord touch me? Make me on fire. So we're going to sing this song with all of our guts, all of our livers before the Lord today. Amen. Let's stand together and worship. Come on.
you for this morning. We thank you for that line, that powerful song, let revival start in me. I pray that that would be our, our cry and our prayer and our anthem over our own lives as we go out of this room this week. Let revival start in me, God. Let each of us cry out that prayer every single day because the revival we desire to see in our world, in our nation, in our cities, and even in our families must begin with the one, must begin with us individually. And I pray that it would this week, that, that as we have that hunger and thirst for you, and as we reach for your presence this week, I pray that it would have a ripple effect to our friends and our families and our coworkers and our city and even our nation and the world around us, God. Let revival start in us this week. Father, we love you. We thank you for a powerful message from Pastor Rick. Help us to carry what he preached this morning all throughout the week. We love you. We praise you and thank you. And everybody said, amen. Let's just clap for the Lord one more time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, thank you so much for coming this morning. One quick word of uh, instruction for you. If you're on this side of the room, you're gonna exit out the side doors. We got some offering boxes over there for you if you'd like to drop your tithes and offerings. For this side of the room, you're gonna actually exit out of the back doors and hang a right through the lobby and get to the parking lot in that way. There's also offering boxes back there. Other than that, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you next week.